Thanks for clicking on the video. Today we're going to be discussing another one of the high yield MCAT sciences. And this one is so good, it's guaranteed to make you Le Chatelier your britches. Good intro. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I am a third year medical student and a professional MCAT tutor. I tutored for a couple of the big name companies, freelance, and now I have um, this organization of my own to where I can help create these MCAT programs with my partner Maggie and, and post these videos on YouTube for free and hopefully prevent or mitigate some of the financial gatekeeping that is definitely in the pre-med world. The series that you're watching now, I think it's called How the MCAT Tests or something like that. And this is essentially just Maggie and I teaching through our high yield MCAT math guide. If you're curious about where to find that or, or what it entails, the, detail, the details around that, make sure to check out the description. There'll be a link there. So today we're discussing Le Chatelier's principle, which is really one of the most useful things to know on the MCAT. A lot of questions will seem like they're talking about something about like, like acid-base chemistry or, or buffer systems or maybe specific like bicarb, something like that. But in reality, they are just a Le Chatelier's principle question. So if there's two main takeaways I want you to, to have, I'm going to throw up a chart um, for you to memorize a little bit later. I want you to memorize that chart. That's one of the main takeaways. And the other main takeaway is when it, whenever you're taking the MCAT, look for Le Chatelier's principle often. It's gonna be there. In a previous video, I talked about enzyme kinetics and we discussed the difference between kinetics and equilibrium. It's a great video if you wanna go back and brush up on that. But on this video, we're actually discussing the equilibrium side of the equation. And that is because all the Chatelier's principle is, is it's the natural things that happen in a reaction to compensate for some disturbance that brings them away from equilibrium. So it is how they compensate to return to equilibrium. Now the common changes that you're gonna see are changes in um, concentration values of products and reactants. That's probably the most common. You can also see changes in temperature. You can see changes in things like pressure. So if you change one of those, the reaction is going to shift either to the left or to the right, meaning favoring either the, pro uh, the reactants or the products. And that shift is going to allow it to return to equilibrium. So that brings up an important question, and that is what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is a state of balance. It is the state where the forward reaction equals the reverse reaction. And that's because in, bio in biology, in chemistry, even though things try to reach like a steady state or a homeostasis, that doesn't mean that there aren't moving pieces. It's just there's an equal amount moving forwards and backwards, and that balances out at equilibrium. That balance is going to allow the ratio of the concentrations of products and reactants to stay the same. Now a good way for me to think of that is by using a seesaw. And so let's go to the whiteboard and I will walk you through a little bit of this. If you imagine a seesaw, you imagine it's perfectly parallel to the ground. And whenever you disturb this, maybe um, you, you add some products that are going to tilt the seesaw, or maybe you add some reactants that are going to tilt the seesaw. Le Chatelier's principle describes the things that the equation will do in order to balance this reaction out. And so the equation will either shift to the left or it will shift to the right, meaning it will favor the reactants or it will favor the products. So here you can see I literally just screenshot one of the pages from our book and threw it in here so that you can see this chart. And we're going to discuss a little bit of these stressors added, how the um, reaction will balance itself, how it will return to equilibrium, and why that's going to happen. So here, you say if we increase the concentration of the substrate, and we can just have a uh, basic reaction here to illustrate it. I know it's not balanced, but it is what it is. So if we increase the concentration of the substrate, maybe we have more oxygen, then the reaction is going to shift away from that increase. If you increase the concentration value of a reactant, then you're going to shift away from that towards the product. This is called a right shift, which kind of makes sense, right? Because it's moving to the right. Now, if you increase the value of the products, the concentration of the products, you're going to shift to the left. You're going to shift away, and that's called a left shift, which kind of makes sense. The reason for that shift in the experience of increasing the substrate is because you, you have to use the concentration that you've added. So if you add more hydrogen, well, now you've got more substrate, you want to use it up. And the way that you use that up is by shifting the whole reaction in favor of products. 
and, and vice versa. So if you increase the concentration of the products, then you have to shift away from that to balance out the equation to return to equilibrium. And that's kind of the surface level of Le Chatelier's principle. Um, going a little bit deeper, you see if you decrease the concentrations here in the second column, if you decrease the concentration of a substrate or the product for that matter, because it works in both directions, then you shift towards that decrease. So either way, you're trying to compensate for what you're adding or taking away. If you have too much, you shift away. If you have too little, you shift towards. So that's with concentrations. That's the easiest way that Le Chatelier's principle is applied, and it's the most common way. The second disturbance or stressor that can be added is pressure. Now this one's a little bit more complicated because you're going to have to know which side has more moles. Now when we're talking about moles, we are talking about moles in the context of molarity is equal to moles per liter. And so it's very possible that you may have to do some calculation either using this formula or perhaps even um, using like molar mass, grams per mole, which will be actually be provided to you via the periodic table. So you may have to use either one of those to determine which one has more moles. And if you increase the pressure, you're going to shift towards the side of moles with fewer gas, or towards the side that has fewer moles of gas, excuse me. And the reason for that makes a lot of sense. So imagine that there are two rooms, and one is very crowded, and one is not that crowded. Well, imagine if you increase the pressure in there. Maybe you, maybe you shrunk the volume, because remember, pressure and volume have an inverse relationship. So imagine if you increase the pressure in there. It's not as comfortable anymore. Well, you would probably want to leave. You'd probably want to go to the room that had fewer moles. And so that's exactly how the reaction wants to carry out. Is it wants to shift. If you increase the pressure, it wants to shift towards the side with fewer moles of gas. Now the inverse is true as well. If you decrease the pressure, then you actually want to shift towards the side with more moles of gas because you get a little lonely. So that's concentration and that's pressure. The last insult that you need to be aware of is the change of temperature. Now there are a couple ways to go about this, but the easiest one is to just view temperature as another substrate or product. But to do that, you first have to figure out, is my reaction endothermic or exothermic? Meaning, does it release energy? Does it release heat? Or does it use heat in the reaction? So let's draw out another reaction, and I know that this is not necessarily correct for this reaction, but it'll help us illustrate it. A lot of people will use delta H to reference heat whenever they're trying to use it as a um, reactant or product. If you have an endothermic reaction, meaning you need to use heat, heat needs to go into the reaction to create the products, well then it goes on the reactant side. That's endothermic. Endothermic. Now if you have an exothermic, meaning it releases heat, well then you're going to add heat to the side of your equation that is the products. Now once you've done that, you can just treat heat like it's a concentration. So let's say we're here, we're, we're using an exothermic reaction. If we increase the heat, which direction is the reaction going to shift? Away from the insult, right? Okay, what if we decrease the heat? Well, it's going to shift to oppose the insult. So that's the basis of Le Chatelier's principle, is that whatever insult we throw at the um, equilibrium, we will get a shift in the reaction to offset that. The last little trick I did touch on a little bit in our kinetics video, and that is this last row I touched on a little bit in our enzyme kinetics video, but this is just a trick question that the MCAT frequently asks, and it is the idea that the addition of catalyst does not impact equilibrium. So if I were to say that I added a catalyst here, if the MCAT were to say they added a catalyst here in the reactants, which direction does that shift the equation? The correct answer is the equation does not shift. And the explanation for that is because catalysis is a measurement of kinetics or how fast something occurs. Speed of reaction and equilibrium don't have anything to do with each other. They're completely separate. 
If you need a more in-depth explanation on how they're separate and, and how they change them, make sure to check out that enzyme kinetics video. But this is a trick question that gets asked on the MCAT a lot. It's something that I've missed a couple of times on practice exams, so make sure that you don't miss that as well. So again, I want to leave you with the most important thing I can tell you about Le Chatelier's principle. Um, besides memorizing this chart, and I will erase all this so you can screenshot it, look for Le Chatelier's principle often. A lot of times those big scary questions that you're kind of nervous about are just Le Chatelier's principle questions. So look for that often. Thank you for watching the video. If you want to support us for zero cost, then like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with a friend and advisor. We really appreciate all those. Or check out the links in the description. We've got some great books that Maggie and I have written that I think have helped a lot of students on the MCAT. Or if you want to study with us, then make sure to check out the Discord channel. Or I don't know, maybe watch another video. Either way, thanks for watching. I hope I taught you something.